Much of the structure and form of 70s anime can be directly traced as a reaction to Mushi Productions' collapse. Founded by Usama Tezuka in 1961, Mushi Productions produced some of the earliest successful animated television, including tremendous hits such as Astro Boy, uh, Tetsuan Adam, and Kimba the White Lion. It was an enormously important studio in the history of Japanese animation, and it constantly hemorrhaged money. Mushi Productions finally collapsed in 1972 when the anime Rama series of erotic art house animated features drove the company's dangerous business model, as Tezuka himself referred to it, to the breaking point. Even beyond Mushi Productions, the industry was doing poorly. This was a period of heavy layoffs. Sunrise was founded from refugees from Mushi Productions collapse and the company was structured to address its perceived failures. In particular, rather than come up with an animated story and then try to seek out advertisers, it sought out potential sponsors first and then asked them what kind of cartoon they'd like to pay for. This partly explains the super robot boom. Because companies selling robot toys were willing to pay for these cartoons, animators were willing to produce them. This is also why super robot shows rarely aired longer than a year. The market would fully saturate and the toy companies would need to drive up demand for a new product. Sunrise underwent a major change in 1976 after disagreements with the Tohoku Shinsha Film Corporation. Sunrise produced the cartoons Yusha Raidin and Zero Tester, both major successes, but Tohoku Shinsha controlled the copyrights and Sunrise didn't receive the share of the profits they felt they were owed. Sunrise would cease working with Tohoku Shinsha and begin working with Tsuburaya Productions and Toei's newly established television division in the process negotiating a larger share of the profits. The first work Sunrise would produce for Toei was Combatler V. Combatler V's director, Tadao Nagahama, had its heroic super robot redesigned several times based around the input of the local children. This delayed the production of the show and the toy by several weeks. While the show was a considerable success, the toy's producer Poppy was unhappy with those delays. For the following year's show, they presented Sunrise with a robot and said, Please do not alter this design. If the two robots look similar to you, it's because they are. After considering different names, including V. Krager and, my personal favorite, Grand Baffler Ace, the new robot and its show were titled Super Electromagnetic Machine Voltus 5. And that is a 5 as opposed to a V. For all the visual similarity and structural similarity to Combatler V, Voltus 5 has some notable distinctions. There's a strong family connection among the characters. Three of the five pilots are brothers, and their parents are the designers of the robot. The father is separated from his sons by the conflict while the mother is killed in an early episode, and the trauma this causes drives much of the show. The other two pilots include the daughter of a general whom she is frequently separated from, and an orphan cowboy who holds resentment for his dead mother. Even the villains have family drama, with the major antagonist's loyalty motivated by a sense of disgrace he holds towards his father. If you ever forget the show is about missing your parents, its ending theme song will gladly remind you. Chichi wo motomete, which roughly translates to I'm missing my father, is something of a western. It begins by imagining birds returning from migration to reunite with their families, and moves on to lamenting, why then is my father lost to me? Ichiro Mizuki, a legend among Japanese theme song artists who sadly passed away last December, delivers a strong performance. The lyrics, which are maybe a little much, were written by Tadao Nagahama, who was once again the show's director. Tadao Nagahama got his start in television puppet theater performing Shakespeare, and many of his shows are described as being stylistically similar to the Taiga dramas, highly theatrical televised historical fiction. 
This is very evident in the highly theatrical Voltus V, which features characters with nesting secret identities, disguised loyalties, disguised motives, hidden parentages and birthrights, and sh so on. By virtue of being a cartoon, even the set pieces get in on this, with parapets transforming into artillery pieces, military bases turning into spaceships, and the like. By the end of the show, the titular combining super robot almost seems quaint. Voltus V is also notable for being one of the most accessible 70s super robot shows in the English-speaking fanbase, thanks to a complete English dub produced in the Philippines. This video will be using the original Japanese audio with the new discotheque English subtitles to keep it consistent with the Compatler V video, but the dub is honestly pretty good. Unlike Compatler V, which ran for an exhausting 54 episodes, Voltus V would only run for 40. The show was popular, but the toy didn't sell as well. This is generally attributed to a change in distribution. The combining Battler V toy was sold as its individual vehicles, but the combining Voltus V toy could only be bought as the complete robot. A salary man could buy their kit, the Combatler V, piece by piece over five paychecks, but they might have needed to save up for the complete Voltus V. The cartoon starts by introducing the Boazon. These horned and vaguely Prussian-themed colonialists are alien invaders from this series. They are opposed by the General Earth Defense Forces led by General Oka and by Big Falcon, a high-tech military base commanded by Professor Hamaguchi. Big Falcon was originally designed by the missing Dr. Go and houses the super robot Voltus V. A couple of things immediately differentiate this from Sunrise's previous efforts. The first is the scale. We get an extensive montage of the Moazan attacking locations around the globe, as well as of the military efforts to resist them. This is something earlier shows discuss, but rarely depict in full. The second is the tone. The earlier Kapatler V was light-hearted and cheerful on the whole. Voltus V is not. It presents the Boazan invaders as a serious military effort and opposing them as difficult, tiresome, and dangerous work. The Big Falcon does not have a conversation pit. The kit pilots, sharpshooter Kenichi Go, CQC combatant Daijiro Go, knife kid Hiyoshi Go, horse guy Ipe Mine, and ninja Nagumi Oka, are given strict military training for years without being informed of the coming boas on invasion. They are then thrown into the Voltus V and told to defend the Earth with very little heads up. The already poor morale further plummets as Dr. Mitsuya Go, mother to three of the pilots, dies in an improbably convoluted manner. Crawling from a hospital bed into a fighter jet to kamikaze herself against an enemy beast knight. Nobody is happy to be there, except maybe Megumi. Now, life can be hard and sometimes you just need to deal is a comprehensible message, but it becomes complicated by what I'm going to call the Hiyoshi problem. Again. The previous year's Combatler V was mostly a breezy, carefree show, and precocious boy genius Kosuke fit right in, going out on fun adventures and helping save the day. Kosuke kicked ass. In contrast, Hiyoshi, Voltus V's kid pilot, well, no one is happy to play as him on the playground. Hiyoshi had his father leave him as an infant, watched his mother die saving his life, and has no real idea what's going on or why he's fighting. And for that matter, I don't know why he's fighting. If the show is going to lean on the whole war sucks and battlefield trauma theming, then why complicate things by putting a 10-year-old in the pilot seat? He's not even particularly skilled. His piloting puts the C in his CPTSD. He's also not dependable, uh, because he's 10. Which leads to some very uncomfortable scenes where he's disciplined by his older brother Kenichi, who's dealing with more than a few problems of his own. Yoshi is not the only questionable member of the team. Ipe is a Japanese-born immigrant to post-bellum United States, whose family ends up on the wagon train somehow. He was about to become a Texas rodeo star when Professor Hamaguchi showed up with armed troops to conscript him. Ipe is irritated by the drama at Big Falcon, does not approve of Kenichi's strict attitude, and is unhappy that they have trouble accommodating his horse. He tries to desert, which makes sense. Uh, from his perspective as a Japanese-American cowboy, He's in the wrong cartoon. Again, in principle, I might not disagree with the lesson of sometimes life is difficult and you may need to adjust or whatever. But the questionable decision to conscript unwilling kids confuses things. Aliens have invaded the Earth. 
I'm certain they could find skilled pilots who'd be eager to serve. They don't have to kidnap cowboys or settle for the terrified 10-year-old who's bad at piloting. It feels like an unforced error. By trying to take the kid pilot seriously, it invites a narrative tension that the cartoon logic of the show cannot resolve. Given how unnecessary all this grief is, it just comes across as the adults in charge being capricious and awful. That would be a good lesson if the framing supported it. Having said all that, this is mostly contained within four specific episodes, three to seven. If you just happened to start watching episode eight, you wouldn't guess that this was ever an issue. Ipe commits himself to the cause, Hiyoshi adjusts to being a pilot, and Kanichi backs off from being such a hard ass. The show allows itself to be more of a cartoon. And past this point, the show starts to pick up. There's a really solid episode exploring the weird internecine politics of the Boas and Invaders, a very entertaining episode where Megumi uses her ninja skills to rescue her father, General Oka, and then the show moves on to its first narrative arc. Credit where it's due. Voltus 5 is a show that sells its punches. Many early episodes have the heroes win only after the robot has been mangled, the big falcon shelled, and a dozen or so red shirts, or teal shirts in this case, have been killed. This is sometimes blunted by a tendency for everything to be patched up and fixed between episodes, but that doesn't always happen. The things that break at the end of an episode have decent odds of staying broken in the next. For an example, take episode 10. General Oka urges the nations of the world to pledge their forces against the Boazen threat in a UN Council meeting. When a Boazen Beast Knight attacks and is swiftly defeated, the assembled nations decide Big Falcon is handling the alien menace well enough and refuse to contribute. However, the weak Beast Knight was a reconnaissance machine sent not to defeat Voltus V, but to X-ray its specs. Armed with this information, the Boazons create a device to interrupt Voltus V's combination. Professor Habaguchi has to order a treat to buy time to repair and augment the damaged robot. Next episode, the Big Falcon base is rushing to develop countermeasures against the Boas and anti-combination beam, which the Boazans will continue to have going forward, but not before General Oka exploits the setback to browbeat the UN Nation members into finally contributing. Big Falcon and Voltus V pull out a temporary victory by developing, and exhausting, a prototype device to boost its magnetism. Next episode, with the need to find a more permanent solution to the anti-combination beam, Professor Hamaguchi and General Oka return to the missing Dr. Go's abandoned secret lab to hopefully uncover useful information. The secret base is attacked by the Boazans, who claim they were clued into its location by the missing Dr. Go himself. Thankfully, they escape with the information they need, and rapidly build and install the Ultra MagCon into the Voltus V. Next episode, now Professor Hamaguchi has to decide if and how he breaks it to the Go Brothers that their father could be a traitor. He loses his chance when the Boazuns lead the Voltus team into a trap using their father's voice as a lure. Professor Hamaguchi dies rescuing the team. Next episode, Big Falcon is operating without a commander, which is bad news for everyone and and, and wait a second, do you see what this is? This is narrative continuity. Earlier Super Robot shows had running themes, minor reoccurring plot lines, and the rare two-parter, but Voltus V is a show with honest-to-god narrative continuity. The future of anime is here. To dial back on my effusive praise for a moment, I'm going to take some time to shine a spotlight on an episode I have trouble with. Remember earlier when I said all the trouble with Yoshi was mostly contained within a few early episodes? Episode 17 titled, and I kid you not, Abandon Love and Tears, is the reason for that qualifier and it's a doozy. Professor Sakanji is brought in to command Big Falcon. He's a wild-eyed mad scientist type whose rugged hands get a close-up and who zooms in on a hovercraft while a jazz rift plays. So he was at least one animator's favorite. Sakanji puts the team on a harsh live rounds training regiment. When Hiyoshi, who I'll remind everyone is 10 years old, endangers himself and the team by lagging behind, Sakanji puts him in a variety of weird torturous training machines to hopefully allow the kid to catch up. Kenichi and the rest of the team object on the grounds that Sakanji is needlessly risking the kid, who is Ten's, life. 
Sakanji manages to alienate the entire Voltus team at once, and they make the executive decision to leave Big Falcon for General Oka's Earth Defense Base. They're attacked en route by a Beast Knight that can outspeed their transformation. Sakanji pleads with the team to trust in his training, they do, and that lets them win the fight. The team decides to stay at Big Falcon, and Sakanji pledges to be more normal. This is a well-crafted, well-paced episode that makes baffling narrative choices, and I go back and forth between being very entertained and a little repulsed. Sakanji, while a complete jackass, is a fun character, and on principle I've never object to a mad scientist, but the show replays its hand in other characters' reactions to him. The show consistently shows the pilot's training to be grueling, it has specifically already done a putting too much pressure on Hiyoshi plotline, Trying to portray the Voltus team as whiners at this point, 17 episodes into the series, feels cheap. It's trying too hard to build heat for Professor Sakanji, who, despite the show's efforts, is too plainly at fault for failing to build trust. Frankly, I'd be happy if Professor Sakanji was just an evil scientist that happened to work for the good guys, rather than him secretly having his heart in the right place. Quit trying to convince me that putting the 10-year-old in the death machine is correct. Thankfully. This is the last time that the Yoshi problem becomes quite so apparent. Sakanji's questionable introduction is followed by the episode that sets the foundation for much of the back half of the series. どうしたんだ、博士。敵です。何？おお、いや。やっそうしゃどもめ。一人残らず宇宙の星風にしてやる。ただ一人を除いてな。さあ、奴はどこにいる？合計カロはどこだ？ドクター健太郎ゴー。
he and the Camp Bellion alien invaders he led were detailed, but unreal. Fantastic. Prince Heimel may dress well and live in an underground Cinderella's palace, but he is merely royalty. His Boazan invasion is, however extravagant, a common military colonialist venture. The Boazan giant robots are beast knights and are controlled through the brains of select soldiers. Some are given the honor of a loyalty, but others earn the privilege through gladiator combat. After the elaborate pageantry of the spectacle, we're then shown the bodies of the defeated being unceremoniously cleaned away by earth movers. For the Boazans, the pageantry is a deflection from a gross reality of dead flesh. The Boazans are rich and powerful enough to be so murderously callous and inefficient. This does raise the question, with all this surplus, why can't Prince Heinel conquer the Earth? Earth is supposedly a backwater planet of little significance. That they've produced a super robot to defend themselves is not totally beyond belief, but it shouldn't be a match against the intergalactic Boazan Empire. That Prince Heinel has had any trouble at all subjugating the planet is enough for the Emperor's right hand, Duke Zaki, to investigate. But things are not as they seem. なんじゃその方はヘイカのスパイとしてハイネルの感謝を仰せつかった身でありながらその心打ちも知らなかったのかまさかヘイカがハイネル様の死を願っておられようとはハイネルをわざわざこのような辺境の星へ追いやられたの
the doctor continuously outwits him as Prince Heinl becomes more and more suspicious. Let's go through them. Sol exploits the fact that Voltus V's pilots know that their father has been captured to lure them into a trap. This backfires as Sol nearly loses his hostage and Daijiro carries back a coded message. Dr. Gol's coded message leads the Voltus team straight to Sol's hidden base. This nearly gets Sol executed as he's forced to engage Voltus V against orders using a beast knight that Prince Heinl isn't aware of to defend a base that shouldn't exist. <laughs> Later, Sol reverses an earlier storyline by building robot duplicates of the pilots to fool their father, hoping to trick him into building a second Voltus V. This plot fails to deceive Dr. Go, and the real pilot's continued search for their father draws further scrutiny to Sol. <laughs> This is a great stretch of episodes. Doe's soul is among the most screwed that any cartoon villain has ever been, and it's a delight waiting to see just how heavily he'll mess up and just how terrible the consequences will be. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think they'd just kill Sol at this point, but the villains refuse to do things the easy way where they could do them an elaborate, complicated way. Prince Heinl offers Sol his life on the condition that he surrenders to Big Falcon and leads the Voltus team into a trap. <laughs> ボルテス Sol tries one last scheme, telling the team he'll lead them to Prince Heinl's castle only to instead lead them into one of his other secret bases, where he hopes to steal the Voltus V. Prince Heinl anticipates his treachery and has the base staffed with loyal soldiers. When those Sol's obsequious submission and flattery fails to appease Prince Heinl's anger, the toady ineffectually throws a knife before being mowed down by gunfire. The villain plots in this show are remarkably entertaining, and Do Sol's ill-fated adventure in particular is a highlight. A slapstick comedian applying the art of slipping out a banana peel to palace intrigue. An absolute Donald Duck of a character playing at faux aristocratic theater drama. Everything goes so poorly that his ultimate execution might as well be a mercy. Anyways, the Voltus team miraculously escapes, because if they don't, there isn't much of a show, and Dr. Kentaro Go is considered missing in action after falling into the sea. Nobody is found, but he's probably dead. Following a charming episode where an orphan puppy saves the day, we're introduced to a new villain. Arriving along a meteor shower and appearing bulwarked in impregnable armor, acclaimed Boazon scientist, engineer, and military leader General Belgen comes to Prince Heinl's castle. He boasts that he can build an armored beast knight that can withstand Voltus V's weapons. While his Maxingol super alloy armor is impressive, the prince still has some reluctance. Belgen chooses to ask forgiveness rather than permission.
拙者とて同じ重視の脳に移植する兵士の決定までもベルガン将軍に任せられたのですかいや世はそのようなことは許可せぬ<笑>恐れながら申し上げます私たちが考えますにはベルガン将軍が突然何の前触れもなく地球にやってきたのは何か裏があると存じますが何申してみようその裏とは何かはい申し上げますもしやあのベルガン将軍は皇帝陛下に命じられてハイニル様を退けやめやしくも我が王子上皇帝陛下に対して何を申す帰れ<笑>二度とそのようなことを申してみよう世は両将軍とて許さん<笑>この鎧重視がボルテスファイブを倒せば私には皇帝陛下からハイネルに代わって地球総司令官の椅子が約束されているのだ<笑>その時が楽しみというものだ The armored beast knight is indeed proof against Voltus V's weapons, but its Maxingol super alloyed armor becomes vulnerable when exposed to the magnetic rays shot by an unidentified mechanical bird. Stripped of its armor, Voltus V is able to triumph. <laughs> やっぱり私の思った通りハイネル様の椅子を狙ってこの裏切りもやめよ世はベルガン将軍を許すほ本当でございますかハイネル様ハイネル様ベルガン将軍世に力を貸せジャンギャルカザリンこの度のことは水に流せ三将軍とも力を合わせ敵を倒す策を考えるのじゃ我々は一致協力してボルテスを倒すのが目的分かったな I appreciate the prince's reaction to this defeat. Sure, General Belgium tried to usurp him, and sure, all his bluster failed when it counted. But this isn't the first time someone's come at him, and Voltus V has won against everyone here a handful of times, so let's just get on with it. The following episodes are a race between the Boazin invaders trying to rush out Maxingol armored beast knights and Big Falcon trying to develop countermeasures. All the while, the mysterious mechanical bird runs interference. Because this is a smart show, Edward at Big Falcon immediately presumes that the mechanical bird must be piloted by the absent Dr. Go. There's a little bit of, hey, let's not give our hopes up, we don't know for certain, but even that stops after the mechanical bird airdrops blueprints for a new weapon. The weapon is rushed through production and functions properly, but using it completely drains Voltus's energy. Professor Sakanji identifies a solution to this problem. Voltus 5 needs a dedicated energy regulator. However, building one sophisticated enough for their purposes would be beyond the capabilities of modern industry. This is solved when the mechanical bird docks with the Voltus mid-combat and provides the regulator. A brief aside, any modern fan of super robots who sees this scene immediately thinks, oh, the mechanical bird is going to become a permanent addition to the combination. It'll turn into wings or a jetpack or something. Unfortunately, this very cool thing does not happen, and probably could not happen. Any significant change to the robot design would have had to have been approved by the toy maker, who, as mentioned, took a very conservative approach to the show. Eventually, the mechanical bird does contact Big Falcon, but it's downed by enemy fire while attempting to land. The Go Brothers rush to save its pilot, only to find out that he isn't their father after all. This is General Danga, last seen in episode 18 being blasted into space. Okay, that's not quite true. Many modern shows would have made a big reveal from the pilot not being Dr. Go. This show lets the audience in on the secret ahead of time. In the episode before this, we're shown that Sol's attack on the refugees left survivors and that General Danga led them in repairing one of the damaged saucers. Using this, they arrive at the location of yet another of Dr. Go's hidden bases. They rescued Dr. Go after he fell into the ocean, worked with him to build the mechanical bird and Voltus V's energy regulator, and are now working on completing the Solar Bird, a giant vessel that could carry the Voltus V to planet Boazan itself. The importance in constructing the Solar Bird as soon as possible is why Dr. Go has kept himself hidden. He doesn't want his sons or himself to be distracted by emotional reunions. 
A refugee experiencing complications after giving birth finally compels them to establish direct contact with Big Falcon to make use of their medical facilities. General Danga flies the mother and her child in when the mechanical bird is finally shot down. The mother and her child are rescued in good health, but General Danga is gravely injured. In the infirmary, he reveals Dr. Go's complicated history to his sons. I have previously described some parts of this show as theatrical, but this flashback puts everything prior to shame. It's halfway between a PBS historical drama and a fairy tale. On the planet Boazan, 14,000 light years from Earth, the aristocrats, Boazan people born with horns, live in lavish luxury while the laborers, Boazan people born without horns, live in squalor. Duke Legol, younger brother to the Emperor, is horrified to learn his son and heir has been born hornless. Momentarily considering filicide, he instead swears all present to secrecy and has his child given prosthetics. That child is Kentaro Go, born Prince Legul. He is intelligently gifted and grows to become Minister of Science. He's the heir apparent, as the Emperor does not have any children capable of succeeding him. His own hornlessness strongly informs his sense of justice, and he dreams of reforming society after he becomes Emperor. These hopes are crushed on the very day of his coronation by the Emperor's bastard son, Zha San Basil. He uncovers Lagul's mother's physician from whom he learns of the prince's prosthetics. <laughs> Imprisoned, stripped of his titles, forcibly separated from his pregnant wife and condemned to forced labor, Lagul now applied his vast scientific mind to revolution. Even as Zhe San Basil, now Emperor San Basil, plots intergalactic conquest. As the hammer comes down on his revolution, his followers urge Lagul to flee. He escapes on a war saucer and wanders the stars before encountering the Earth and his future wife, Mitsuya Go. Recognizing that Boaz and expansion will eventually overtake Earth, he colludes with Matsuya Go, Professor Hamaguchi, and General Oka. They develop plans for defending the planet, including what would become the Big Falcon base and the Voltus V itself. Somehow, Emperor San Basil learns where Dr. Go Le Nagul fled and sent him a message. Return to Boazan, or Earth will be immediately attacked. Dr. Go does return, but when the Emperor demands he design him weapons, he refuses and is sentenced to death. From here, the story progresses as we've already seen. General Danga, a highly honored general who cut off his horns in solidarity with the oppressed, rescues him. Much later, they and a cohort of freed boys and slaves flee to the Earth. Dosol intercepts them, captures Dr. Go, and kills many of the refugees, only for General Danga to save him once again. Eh, <sighs> that's a lot. This would have been a very dense episode for even a modern show. The best media comparison that comes to mind, at least in anime, are the parts in Legend of the Galactic Heroes where Julian Mintz spends whole episodes watching documentaries. And here we have it in a toy commercial cartoon for 6 to 12 year old boys. Now, not all of this is unprecedented. Sunrise's show for the previous year, Combatler V, also featured an invading space empire that underwent a revolution. However, in that show, it happened off screen. The good guy alien flies in from stage right on a space sleigh like Santa Claus and announces that the whole evil empire situation has been dealt with. Here it's recounted in bloody detail, and the good guy aliens do not have things at hand. Uh, General Danga isn't presenting a history lesson, he's making an argument. Our wars are the same, make common cause with us.
Let's come back to this in a moment though. There are some details I want to highlight before I continue. First, the planet Boazon has been present in the opening of the cartoon since episode 1. It's the planet with two rings Voltus 5 poses over. Those same rings are visible from the ground in many of the shots in the flashback. Secondly, I love how well characterized Emperor San Basil is from what little time he has. He's been spoken of several times before now, and his image has been shown with some regularity, uh, peering over the more immediate villains like the Phantom. But this is the first time the show has shown him in action, and we get a lot from a very little. In particular, he's one of the few people who know that Prince Lagul and Dr. Go are the same person. His decision to have Prince Heinel lead the invasion on Earth, uh, to have his firstborn son and adopted planet destroy one another, is an incredible act of spite. You did catch on that Prince Heinel was his missing son, right? In a show with many entertaining villains, Emperor San Basil easily holds his own. For that matter, Planet Boazon itself is well characterized from very little. The imagery is perhaps blunt, but it's effective and well conveyed, especially for something which to re-emphasize as a uh, toy commercial cartoon for 6 to 12 year old boys. Check out the Space Pope's Horned Skull Staff. One final detail before I move on. This technically shows up a bit later, but while we were discussing Dr. Go's history, let's take a look at how Prince Heinel's personal guard is armored. Presumably, he would have inherited them from one of his parents, and we might guess that he wasn't allowed much of what has been his father's. Dr. Go designed the Voltus V to resemble the uniform of his first wife's personal guard. This is never spelled out. You just have to recognize the similarity and draw the connection. It's an incredible mark of restraint and confidence from the anime. <laughs> The reveal of Dr. Go's prior life is incredibly consequential. Every episode from here on out will either address life as a person of multiple heritages, conflicts between Earth and Boazan society and culture, a circa late 70s Japan, or surprisingly, labor issues. There's a lot of character action. Poor Kenichi, who you would be forgiven for thinking was the protagonist, basically has all his character development in this latter third of the show. There's a lot of meat on this bone. You could take any of these episodes and find something to say about it, but I'm going to try and limit myself to what I consider the most significant moments. First off, Guilan's story. Guilan is a horned Boazan born to lower class hornless parents. While he's technically nobility, he has no prospects and so became a gladiator where he excelled. General Belgen considers him a promising beast knight candidate. Guelan, now Armored Beast Guelan, captures Hiyoshi and proposes an exchange for General Danga, unaware that he has died. When he's informed, he grieves and then releases Hiyoshi to challenge Voltus V fairly. Voltus V triumphs as is typical, but as Guelan was gallant enough to spare Hiyoshi, Kenichi spares Guelan in turn. When Guelan objects to being spared by an earthling, Kenichi reveals his bow as an heritage, satisfying him. What happens next? Prince Heinel has Guelan executed, and desecrates his giant robot corpse by littering it over Big Falcon's grounds. Kenichi takes this very, very poorly, and after driving off his latest attack, makes certain that General Danga and Guelan are both sent off with full military honors. One thing that's always worth paying attention to in good guy versus bad guy cartoons is the actual differences between the good guys and the bad guys. Is it just a battle of primary colors versus secondary colors? Do the villains perform completely harmless crimes, or, or conversely, is their wickedness so over the top as to be unbelievable? The goofus and gallantness of this show may be artless, but it allows its concerns to be very, very specific. The Boazan invaders do not respect other people's lives. 
They don't respect their own people's lives. They sweep aside corpses without thought. The Earth Defense Forces and Big Falcon, by contrast, give full military honors to General Danga and Beast Knight Guaylon. But it's easy enough to show respect for the enemy when you like them personally. A few episodes later, the Voltus pilots are tested under harsher circumstances when they get the drop on someone they have more animosity towards, Jiang Gao. のぞみ通り殺してる。やめろ、一平。やめるんだ。うるせえ。お前の袋さんも浜口博士もこいつらに殺されたのを忘れたのか。よせ、一平。ジャンギャルは俺たちの捕虜だ。殺すことは分かって
Professor Sakanji spells out that the goal has become explicitly to travel to Boazad and freed laborers. This invites Kenichi's reply to be read as a response to a labor issue. Is your coworker having trouble at work? Are they showing up drunk and belligerent? Is the boss man getting pissed? From this perspective, Kenichi's response becomes, none of that matters. You stand in solidarity with your fellow laborer, drunkenness or bigotry be damned. Unfortunately, the rest of this episode doesn't hold together. The Boazin invaders attack on foot, and the technician gets to die heroically protecting the base, neatly invalidating any concerns of his future employment. After an enjoyably messy exploration of an honest conundrum, the conclusion is too clean. But set that aside, and let's go back to the whole free the laborers thing. And while we're at it, see how the Boazin invaders are understanding the matter of the Go Brothers' paternity. <laughs> While most of the villains are content to take the Go Brothers' paternal claims as illegitimate, Jiangol reasons that if they are true, then that would mean that something has gone terribly wrong with the invasion. He has to convince Prince Heinel to take this new danger seriously. The Boazan nobility's bigotry and superiority complex is an actual obstacle to Jiangal, and to make his point, he has to twist it against itself. If the opponents were Boazans, then there's no shame in losing to them for 30 episodes straight. What's most interesting is Jiangal's ultimate concern. It's not just that they've been underestimating their enemy. It's not just that the improvements to Voltus V might continue to outpace their own. It's that any connection between the forces protecting the Earth and the actual Boazan motherland would represent a danger to the Imperial Center. The show is using its galactic setting to provide a very literal usage of universalism. The actual plot that follows from this is a somewhat convoluted scheme to expose the pilots to a Boazan illness and see how their immune system reacts to it. The Go brothers do recover, which strongly suggests that they do have Boazan genetics, and the medical team is able to craft a vaccine from their antibodies to heal Ipe and Megumi as well. The obligatory Beast Knight is then swiftly defeated. By the time it reaches Boazan, it will be too late. Big Falcon, Voltus V, and the Boazan refugees have gone from being an uncommonly spirited resistance to being an existential threat to the Empire. If you were watching the show in the Philippines in the 70s, this is about where the story ends. In April 1979, certain violent robot cartoons would be taken off of Filipino television. These included Mazinger Z, Daimos, and Voltus V. Hilariously, my understanding is that not all robot shows are banned. I think Makanda Robo, for example, stayed on television, which I imagine felt like rubbing salt in the wound. In Japan, Voltus V is a well-regarded cartoon that's mostly remembered for being less goofy than the earlier Combatler V. In the Philippines, the circumstances of Voltus V's cancellation have made it immortal. It had one of the most maliciously timed cliffhangers imaginable, with Dr. Go's mysterious solar bird continually being teased as everything revved up for a final confrontation with Prince Heinel. This was all the more bitter because the ending did exist. The whole show was fully produced. You just weren't allowed to see it. Against all odds, and further propelling the show's popularity, when the ending was finally broadcasted in 1999, it may have lived up to all 20 years of hype. A counterintuitive fact about Super Robot shows from this era is that many of the better ones were cancelled. There's a couple reasons for this, but an important one is, this is formula television. The most common problem with these shows are their highly specific episodic structures and poor pacing. If things are going well, then there's some incentive not to rock the boat. But if the show has already been cancelled, then there's no further risk. And if the show is going to conclude its story in however many episodes it has left, it might need to move quickly to finish it all. 
Voltus 5 was a hit show, but as mentioned earlier, some poor decisions on Bandai's part meant the toy was not as successful as hoped. I could only guess when the animators at Sunrise learned the show had been cancelled, but the final five episodes of this show absolutely sprint. Some half dozen plot points get wrapped up in episode 36. It begins with General Garul arriving from planet Boazan to berate Pritz Heinel. Emperor Sen Basil's plan to have Lagul's heir and Dr. Go's rebellion destroy each other has disappointingly led to a stalemate. General Garul is here to break it. Because the show loves irony, this is happening as Heinel's forces have finally located the Boazan refugees in Dr. Go's hidden mountain science factory base. And to make things even more dramatic, all this is happening as the refugees are hours away from finishing construction on the Solar Bird spaceship. <laughs> The Boazans are able to pressure the refugees for a while since the pilots at Big Falcon don't actually know the location of the secret base. The Voltus V does eventually show up and save the day, but in the last moment General Garul snatches up Dr. Go. General Garul then leads the Voltus team to Prince Heinel's castle before covertly escaping with his captive. As the Voltus V approaches, Prince Heinel pushes the button to transform his castle into a fortress. <laughs> Dr. Go's hidden base is finally exposed. The Boazin refugees are dragged into the main plot line. Dr. Go is captured. The Boazin invader's hidden base is exposed. The Sword of Damocles that had been dangling above Prince Heinel for nearly 30 episodes has finally begun to fall. The episode finally ends with the narrator asking, how will this unyielding struggle between Voltus and Heinel end? While the whole of Voltus V can be seen as a refinement of the previous year's Combatler V, episode 37 in particular retreads much of the same ground. To start with, the Voltus pilots attacking Heinel's underground castle is the same scenario as Combatler V attacking Oleana's underground base. What's interesting, then, is what this later show does differently. Kenichi spells out that they have the explicit goal to free the captured humans and slaves held inside. This is necessary given they expect Dr. Go is among them and is in character given their opposition to Boaz and slavery. But it makes the equivalent moment in Combatler V a little more grim in retrospect. The bad guys in that show also kept human slaves in their underground base, but uh, those slaves weren't shown being rescued. Voltus V also displays a different style of action. Where Combatler V was one robot fight after another, in this episode we avoid that. Instead of an outright brawl, we have lots of clever movement centered around the conceit of combining. Megumi detaches the feet to fly around independently, and later she leads all of Voltus's constituent parts as they drill into the castle single file. Jiango goes to meet them head on in drill to drill combat, but that doesn't pan out. Jiango is the only one here. There aren't any other soldiers. General Garul and General Belgian relay orders from the Emperor. The colonization of Earth is cancelled. Prince Heinel is relieved of command. His troops are already leaving. But he is not to return to Boazan. Fatalistically, Heinel prepares to fight to the bitter end. The last troops loyal to Prince Heinel, curiously dressed quite similarly to the Voltus V robot itself, put up some fight, but they're too few to match against all five protagonists together. Jiangol commits suicide to avoid capture, the slaves are freed, 
They learn Dr. Go is not among the slaves and have been taken to planet Boazong. Prince Heinel's castle is then occupied. The castle is straight up occupied. I, I didn't know you could occupy an evil science fantasy castle. I thought those always dramatically exploded or collapsed into the earth. But no, uh, helicopters arrive and fly in troops. I didn't think that was allowed. Prince Heinel is taking all of this about as well as you'd expect. Taking another cue from the early Combatler V, Catherine tranquilizes him and then tosses his sleeping body into the escape rocket. Every single object or person in the show is something or someone disguised as something or someone else. You come to expect it after a while, but even when you know it's coming, it doesn't stop being fun. General Gruul and General Belgen notice Prince Heinel's escape, and Belgen remarks how it's a shame the prince won't be on planet when his magmite bomb blows it up. Now the castle explodes as the towering bomb is revealed from beneath. The threat of a planet obliterating bomb is one final repeat from Combatler V. In the earlier cartoon, the bomb was stopped by the intervention of Deus, by which I mean a giant robot literally named Deus, who came from the planet of the villainous aliens. In that show, the bad aliens were overthrown off screen by a revolution of good aliens. I honestly appreciate its conclusion for how outrageously out of left field it was. That's not the kind of show Voltus 5 is. Voltus 5 doesn't do outrageously out of left field, it does convoluted setups and payoffs. If the show is going to have a planet destroying bomb be stopped by good guy aliens, it'd have them be good guy aliens whom we were already introduced to. And it's not just going to drop some new giant robot, it'd be a machine we've already seen before. Hence, the solar bird is finally revealed. Just what kind of power does the solar bird contain? Well, this is a giant robot show about a super robot that combines, so what kind of power do you think it has? The show had been cancelled, all remaining airtime is at a premium. The animators still found time for this elaborate and indulgent combination sequence. This is something they wanted. And so while I can't quite highlight every single cool moment in the final episodes, and there are a few, I will let most of the Big Falcon and Solar Bird combination play out. Overthrowing the monarchy is cool and all, but the real good stuff is watching two flying buildings click together like Legos. You can tell how tight airtime was, because after the combination sequence finishes, the Solar Bird is already out of Earth orbit. The heroes chased off the invaders, they got rid of the Magmite Bomb, why waste any more time here? The show provides a very brief introduction to General Doyle. He's only barely a character, the show needs someone to represent the Boaz and refugees who fled to Earth, and every other one who's been named is either dead or captured. Contrasting with Doyle, we get a moment of Watsonian explanation as Ipe asks Megumi to explain warping to the audience. It's kind of wild to think that when this cartoon first aired, it wasn't taken for granted that kids would just immediately recognize this sci-fi trope. We also get a bit more of that good guys do this, bad guys do this, goof is a gal attack. In this case, warp travel carries a certain level of risk. Since you can't see your destination, you might crash into something on the other side. Dr. Go designed the Solar Bird to have unmanned scout drones, but the Boazin instead just accept that they'll occasionally lose some saucers and have any important personnel follow behind the main group. It's hard to view this distinction on moral grounds since the Boazin approach is almost too foolish to believe, even if it is in line with their society. Using unmanned ships to test routes cannot be such a brilliant idea that only Dr. Go could have thought it up. Then again, even with the drones, the Solar Bird nearly crashes into a big rock, so maybe they're not that great after all. The big rock itself feels mostly perfunctory. You can imagine the script writer asking, we have a commercial break coming up, how do we gin up some suspense? Oh, just chuck a rock at them. But past that, we get legitimate conflict. This is actually the first time Emperor San Basil is shown in person outside of flashbacks, although his presence has been felt for much of the show. He makes a hell of an impression, enforcing his ridiculous military decorum on General Garul, but the show avoids making him a fool.
ラゴールだどどういうことでございましょう気圧が地球人にスペースワープの技術を教えたに違い Sam Basil immediately pegs the solar bird as being one of Dr. Go's creations, and since Prince Heimel is out of the picture, he's dropped all pretense that Dr. Go is not Prince Lagool. He gives General Garul three fleets and the space battleship Zoltum, and tells him to go take care of things. From there, we move on to a ship battle in space. Beyond an amusing line about how the Voltus machine's weapons are stronger now that there's no air resistance, the real notable moment is when the battleship Zoltum fires a gravity shot. This is certainly a direct reference to the wave motion cannon from the 1974 show Space Battleship Yamato. Space Battleship Yamato was a show in which a certain sunken World War II battleship, which held a certain cultural significance for a certain imperial nation, was retrofitted for space travel and launched on a mission to save the Earth. The show has been the subject of certain criticisms that, without getting too deep in the weeds, make it very interesting how this cartoon gave its signature weapon to the enemy battleship. And while it might seem coincidental, surely it's not unreasonable for a space battleship to have a big gun, I do think this is a direct reference. The wave motion cannon was a fairly new trope at the time, and Yamato only really became as popular as it did after its completion movie was released in 1977, contemporaneous with Voltus V. So this battle is in effect between the would be liberators of the laborers, represented by Solar Bird and Voltus V, and the slave holding colonialists, represented by an XP of the Yamato. The gravity shot wipes out one of the Boaz and Empire's own fleets before being neutralized by some gizmo on the solar bird, which is something of a rude anti-climax. That's not a problem. Emperor San Basil has a backup plan. Sodom and Gomorrah are a pair of artificial satellites that project a destructive electromagnetic net between them. They drive the solar bird through the rings of Boazon, which project a particle flow that is likewise destructive. Both the satellite and the rings have been visible in the opening credits this whole time. This is a payoff to 38 episodes worth of unsuspected setup. The actual solution isn't too astonishing. General Doyle proposes some techno babble solution, and after a thoughtful and dramatic pause, it's put into practice. At this point, the thrill isn't seeing the Voltus team survive, we know they will. Instead, the thrill is seeing the villains lose. And with that in mind. <laughs> Hell yes. General Doyle broadcasts the arrival of Voltus V, and various labor militias take this as their cue to rise up. Notice how many of them fly a blue flag with white doves. That's Lagool's heraldry. And speaking of, Dr. Go himself is quickly rescued. What follows next is a winning battle. The Solar Bird does take damage and is forced to land, but most of the enemy fleet is in shambles. There are evidently no beast knights stationed near enough to defend the capital, and the Boazan troops are in disarray. There's only one person left unaccounted for. Prince Heinel wakes up from his slumber to a world at war. Catherine begs him to abandon planet Boazan for some distant and presumably conquered world without conflict, as Emperor San Basil is not expected to come out ahead. Prince Heinel rejects her offer and rides off to save the Empire on a horse. The sun sets behind them as we get one of the most indulgent endings to a cartoon episode imaginable. <laughs>
This is the final episode. There's a good couple or so minutes of the Voltus V just wrecking shit, plowing through fortifications, stomping on tanks, marching at the forefront of its army. The show drops all the heroic pro wrestling-esque stylizations and reverts to pure giant monster imagery. The dark cityscapes, tall towers, rolling tanks, and the panicked fleeing people give it something of an original Godzilla vibe. The depiction of a super robot as an implacable monster is surprisingly rare in 70s cartoons. Mazinger Z played with the idea on occasion, but following shows shied away from this approach. Super robots in this era are big and strong, but they're usually also safe, protective, and fully controlled by their pilot. They're obedient. But this episode shows us a ground view of the Voltus V in operation, and from that vantage point, it's a dangerous and aggressive machine. Obedience is no virtue when you're fighting the monarchy. Whatever chance Emperor San Basil had of maintaining order has long passed. Even if his forces could defeat Voltus V, which they very much cannot do, that wouldn't be enough. His troops are scattered, the slaves have rallied, the damage is done. Five minutes have passed since the start of the episode and the war is already over. This is the scene Prince Heinel finds as he approaches San Basil's castle by a hidden entrance. When he vows to cut down anyone cowardly enough to run, a noble takes a shot at Heinel with a rifle. Catherine very slowly rides up on a carriage to take the bullet for him. Catherine's death is, unfortunately, something of a weak spot in the episode. It suits the needs of the plot, and there's a certain drama in how her death was preventable if only Heinel were less bellicose. Still, it kind of sucks that the character who had up until a few episodes ago been a ruthless royal assassin has to play the dead woman for someone else's character moment. Once again, this is a plot beat that had been done in Kabatler V first, and for once I think it did the bit better. Mia had much more agency in her death and she gave one of the best fights of her show. It's also more than a little preposterous how the scene plays out, like, on a physical level. Catherine somehow enters the scene and crosses the entire courtyard on her carriage before the man with a gun can shoot Prince Heinel, who is standing maybe five meters away from him. Finally, it introduces an honest-to-god continuity error. Prince Heinel pledges to destroy the Voltus, to no great surprise, but he also very specifically promises Catherine that he will not die. So it's a bit of a switch when, moments later, we see him try and commit ritual suicide by throwing his body onto a pyre. The pyre in question is held by a stone idol of Gudul, god of the Boazan Empire. Because everything in the show is disguised as something else, you might guess where this is going. The idol is in fact a giant robot, and Prince Heinel has just earned the right to be its pilot. This is what the series comes down to. A battle between Godel, the guardian of Boazan, an icon representing the history of racial supremacy and slavery, and the Voltus V representing revolt. What could easily be just an obligatory giant robot fight to close out this series is elevated into a thesis statement. After both machines collapse, Heinel forces the fight to continue against Kenichi's objection. The sword fight happens atop Godel's outstretched hand, Heinel staying clutched within the grasp of its ideology. When their swords shatter, Heinel draws a dagger. Astonishingly, Dr. Go recognizes it as a gift he once presented to his first wife. When Heinel exclaims that, in fact, the dagger was an heirloom from his mother, the facts become all too clear. An inspection of the hilt revealing Legol's heraldry and the emblem of the Boazon laborers confirms the unimaginable. At least, unimaginable for the characters. <laughs> the family reunion is made all the more tragically complete 
by citizen Zhe San Basil's sudden appearance. His panicked demands to be allowed to flee with his wealth and his shameless attempt to dodge the blame of Earth's invasion confuse and infuriate Heinel, who throws the dagger into his heart. San Basil drops his grenade and the whole edifice goes up in flame. I really dig this. To hell with measuring out one or two teaspoons of pathos, just up in the whole bottle onto the screen. The show goes heavy on literalizing. For example, a, a specter haunts Boazan, and that specter is a very tangible 58 meter tall and 600 ton robot. It grapples with a myriad systems perpetuating justice by literally grappling with their personification. Dismantling the divine right of kings by literally dismantling the divine. Now we have the divisions and stratifications which defined Boazan society for generations excised by the liberating truth that all men are brothers, literalized by Heinle and Kenichi's shared paternity. Arguably, this is too narratively convenient, since Heinle's death forecloses any question of what to actually do with the guy afterwards. But I can't criticize the show for having them romantically fade away into the flames. A after all, I'm watching this show for the melodrama. And what more appropriate way to end things then the system Heinel spent his life supporting, finally collapsing over top of him. We get one final scene of everyone shaking hands and the team heads back home to Earth while Dr. Go stays behind to help build a new society. But don't worry. Now that they have the solar bird, they can come visit each other any time. The end. Voltus 5's ending is conclusive, but there are a handful of things I'd like to discuss that either didn't fit in clearly anywhere earlier or else needed a broader view of the whole show. The podcast, The Great Gundam Project, covered Voltus 5 around a year ago, and one particular line that stood out for me from episode 229 was that Voltus 5 had that vintage 70s sexism. This is undeniable, but there are some peculiarities with the structure of the show that, in my opinion, make it a step up from the previous years in Battle V. Specifically, Megumi Oka is the most well-defined character among the show's five pilots. Nagumi is the only pilot with an immediately present living family member, the father General Oka of the Earth Defense Force. She's the heir to her family's legacy as a prominent ninja clan. All this gives her a strong connection to the larger set in the show that the other pilots largely do not have. At least not until the big reveal about Dr. Go's history 70% of the way through the series. She's also the pilot with the most character-focused episodes, and while they're all problematic each in their own ways, uh, in most of them she comes across quite well. Episode 9 is one of the better early episodes, and features Megumi ditching the Voltus team to rescue her father from an assault on the Earth Defense Headquarters. She gets to be the hero and saves the day with her ninja skills, and when she finally returns to the team to help them defeat the Monster of the Week, her absence is excused with... I guess that's how women are before they get married. Which is bad, I think, but I mostly don't know how to take it. If you're an unmarried woman who practices ninjutsu, please chime in with your thoughts in the comments. Another highlight episode is 35, where Megumi comes damn close to assassinating General Belgian. It sadly doesn't take, but the attempt shows initiative. In contrast, Episode 31 is the bad Megumi episode, where the Boazan forces use all women's irresistible desire for jewelry to hypnotize Megumi with the magic diamond. The episode is tragically important to her character arc and deals a lot with her relationship with her father and her anxiety over having to one day succeed him. It'd be a great episode if only she had more agency during it. The wild thing is that despite all the vintageness, she is still the most realized character among the five pilots. In my Combatler V video, I said that the largest problem with its female characters was with prominence. That there were fewer of them and they didn't have as much screen time as the male characters. The fact that Voltus V devotes so little time to its male cast makes Megumi come across better uh, almost by default. 
The Go brothers and Ape are all withdrawn and insular. Megumi talks to the people. She has connections outside of her role as combatant. She even has something approaching a character arc. I recognize none of this is strong praise. I, I'm grading on a curve. When I rewatched Combatler V for my video, I was surprised by how Christian it was. The male lead grew up in a Catholic orphanage. There was an Honest to God Mary Sue episode where the too good for this earth little girl was named Maria and her unfortunate murder was mourned by ringing every church bell in the city. In the final episode, the planet is saved by God, uh, Dias, who congratulates the good guys for being forthright before ridding the royal of evil. Voltus V does not share that view. The overwhelming majority of religious depictions come from the feudal society of planet Boazon, where it's uniformly depicted as an institution that supports the status quo. The space pope's staff is topped with a horned skull and encircled by a snake, as is the pillar Dr. Go is tied to for his execution. Prince Heinl ritually anoints himself with hawk's blood before engaging Kenichi in a duel on an arctic glacier. It's always presented as an interest of the nobility and exclusively connected with death imagery. A stone idol of Godel, to whom Heinl offers his life, being the ultimate example. Earth religion, including Christianity, is almost entirely absent. Its most prominent appearance is in the Duel with Prince Heinl episode, which contains a sequence where Kenichi is led through an empty church containing a large stone crucifix. The nun is secretly Catherine leading Kenichi into a trap, and the beatific icon is secretly a bomb. This is a notable and extreme change between the two shows. The change might be because the Christian universalism of Combatler B could be seen as incompatible with the class-based universalism of Voltus V. Opium of the people, halo over a veil of tears, and such. It would also go a ways into explaining why the bad guy is specifically named Saint Basil. I can't propose that with Full confidence, however, because I'm not certain that the show was always written with class consciousness in mind. The show ends with the Voltus V as the symbol for a pan-galactic union of laborers opposing colonialist aristocracy, but that's not how the show starts. General Oka corralling the UN to pitch in for the war effort, Professor Sakanji exhorting the necessity of true teamwork, Hiyoshi, Ipe, and the rest having to put aside their personal lives to become cog in the super electromagnetic machine? The message here isn't pro labor or socialist, it's us versus them. Depending on the episode, the Voltus V might be a symbol of the revolution, a purely military endeavor, or even an emblem of Prince Lagoule's feudal aristocratic house. I haven't touched on that last bit, but uh, to wit. It's a knight in shining armor, fighting with a longsword supporting the rightful good emperor, and opposing the enemy beast knights, supporting the wrongfully appointed bad emperor. This is even more apparent in some pre-production designs that pair the sword with the shield. Some of this is certainly by design, uh, the Voltus robot will mean different things to different characters, but some of it is because the vector of the narrative, uh, the very design in question, changes direction at several points. At first, outside the introduction, the series is a disconnected monster of the week with no narrative throughline. Episode 8 not only introduces the internecine drama among the villains, it also lays the foundation of the narrative arc where General Oka wrangles the Earth nations together as a contrast to the Boazan's self-sabotage. This is the show at peak us versus them. We must unite against the foreign threat. Episode 18 refocuses on the Go Brothers' grief at missing their father, and introduces the racial and class conflicts within Boazem society. If you went to Voltus V expecting the Labor Revolution show, you're going to be very confused up until then. However, all of this will define the structure of the rest of the show. It's a tremendous shift in the narrative. Episode 28 alters the direction of the show again, narrowing its focus almost entirely to Dr. Go's history and his connection to Boazem's labor conflict. What had been a meander becomes a steady march. With most completed, single-team produced works of media, you can suppose that the storyline was fully planned out from the start. Not necessarily in totality, but at least thematically and in general form. Voltus V really does not come across as such a work. The show's initial vector is too out of line from where the show ends up. 
it makes some hard left turns, if you'll pardon the pun. This introduces the question, why? Was this turn towards class antagonism instigated by something? Did something happen during production? Yoshiyuki Tomino left the show around episode 18. He and series director Tadao Nagahama were both known to be opinionated. Maybe his departure unrestrained Nagahama? The space battleship Yamato movie was released around episode 10. Maybe the change was a reaction against its popularity? Many of the animators were veterans of Mushi Productions' earlier collapse. Could Sunrise's monetary concerns following the trouble with Tohoku Shinsha have sparked some pro-union fervor? Was this extremely belated support for the 1968 student activism movements? While there is some information about the cartoon's production which has not been translated to English, I personally doubt any of it would contain an answer. It'd be unprofessional to acknowledge any instigating beefs. It sure is fun to speculate, though. Voltis 5 was the third super robot show Sunrise animated over as many years, and the simple fact is they have gotten very practiced at it. The cartoon has remarkably little stock animation in comparison with other shows of its type. The combination plays out in every episode, granted, but many of its special attacks are uniquely animated per episode. This includes the sword cut finisher, where the Voltis gruesomely twists the edge. Many Beast Knights get their own bespoke disembowelments. This show brings back the split screen from Compatler V, where each pilot's face would be shown simultaneously. It introduces an effect where the borders dividing them will change and alter in reaction to their moods and conversations. This technique has become iconic. Just in general, it feels more refined and more confident than previous shows, with some surprising visual techniques. Check out how it projects the visage of San Basil over the slavery he profits from. No wonder Earth needs a giant robot to defend it when he looms so large. Voltus 5 has a few cameos to previous Sunrise work as well. Episode 32 briefly features a villainous combining robot, which just so happens to share design elements from the 75 Rydeen and the 76 in Battler V. In a modern show, I'd imagine this robot would be an opponent across a two-parter or maybe a recurring threat. Here, the villains can't quite figure out the fine details of the supermagnetic combination, and the team swiftly thrashes it before it can combine. Another cameo is the giant cyborg ape, Gonger. He was the tragic villain-slash-victim of episode 18 of Raideen. He shows up in Voltus 5 as the monster of the week for episode 13. He has the same name and the same design and even the same personality. It's nice to know the fellow kept getting work. Overall, Voltus 5 is just a surprisingly good-looking show, to the point that the current release being in standard definition is kind of a shame. There are some shots where the lack of resolution is tragically evident, especially in scenes with darker backgrounds. Episode 18, which is largely in outer space, has several shots that would be gorgeous if they were just a little less blurry. For that matter, so does the opening credits. At the very start of this video, I brought up the Hiyoshi problem, where the show acknowledges that piloting a war machine is probably a bad thing for a 10-year-old child to do, but then has it happened anyways. Voltus 5 ultimately pulls back from it, which is probably the correct choice. Addressing the ethics of child piloting would have been a hard task for the show since its format required it. It's already a show where conflict is resolved through improbable giant robot battles, so playing loosely with Hiyoshi was something it could get away with. But another approach was available. The show could also have leaned in on it, and just starkly depicted the trauma this would cause. What would Voltus 5 have been like if it simply and unhesitantly acknowledged that, yes, putting a child in the robot pilot seat is an act of harm, and then committed to that? Well, it'd be like Zambot 3. Zambot 3 doesn't exactly follow Voltus 5, it was contemporaneous with it. This is the show that Yoshiyuki Tomino directed after leaving Voltus 5 around episode 18. It was an experimental project for Sunrise, since the original work was solely owned and produced by them after its rebranding. As an experiment, it was designed to run only six months instead of the full year. As it happened, both it and Voltus 5 would have their final episodes run on the same day. It's a heavy affair. Similar to Voltus 5, much of the main cast are descendants from an alien planet, and they face considerable discrimination once this becomes public knowledge. The Super Robot is an heirloom from their former planet, and the cast feels an obligation to personally use it in defense of the Earth. This involves volunteering their own children as pilots. 
Is this a wise choice? No. Does it turn out well? No. Do they do it anyways? Yes. Does this constant exposure to danger, conflict, and war traumatize the children? Yes. It's a well-regarded but infamous series, in no small part because of how its young cast is affected. Voltus V was the second of the Nagahama Romance Robot series. Tosho Daimos is the third. This show continues the trend in Voltus V, and Zambot 3 for that matter, of having less overtly antagonistic space aliens and more material conflicts by having the plot begin with the space aliens peacefully seek refuge on Earth after their home planet was destroyed. It also continues the themes of anti-bigotry and recognizing the personhood of immigrants by having the space aliens seek refuge on Earth after their home planet was destroyed. As it happens, negotiations to have all this happen peacefully do not go well. Kazuya Ryuzaki pilots the Karateka battle robot Daimos in defense of the Earth, but things become complicated when he meets Erika, the daughter of an assassinated alien leader. Tosho Daimos is famous as the 70s robot show with the Romeo and Juliet romance. Well, they're both a little older than Romeo and Juliet were, and the show ends on a happier note than that play does, or Zamba 3 for that matter. They are star-crossed lovers though, and that's enough to count. It's also notable for being one of the best-looking super robot shows of its decade, with very little else coming close. I touched on Voltus V's success and significance in the Philippines briefly before, but it cannot be overemphasized. The show was one of the best produced of its set of localized anime, and had tremendously strong viewership numbers. The government's decision to cancel it, officially because of its violence, was and is commonly seen as a spiteful act of government overreach. The fact that it was cancelled just before the heroes topple a dictator elevated the show to mythical proportions. This incredible 12-foot monument by artist Toim Imao, produced in 2014, is a particularly impressive example of the show's sustained prominence and influence. An even more notable example of Voltus V's legacy is Voltus V Legacy, a live-action and CGI production by the Philippine media company GMA Network. Where it is that it's coming out in second quarter 2023, so likely not long after this video is released. I have absolutely no idea what to expect from this. All the promotional work looks solid, but if you're going to make a new Voltus 5 show for the new millennium, then you need to address the original show's biggest failing. The mechanical bird must turn into wings. Giant robot falcon wings. It needs to make the wing zero look bald. Is the cartoon actually good? Yeah. Oh, there are some qualifiers. Early episodes are rough. Beyond everything with Yoshi, most early episodes are terribly paced. Even when something cool happens, like Kenichi inexplicably trying to fetch a bullet between some rocks, it's an isolated moment in an episode where nothing else happens. But, 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 if you can stomach these weaker episodes, the show picks up. Everything from episode 8 on is good, and from 18 on is great. The final five episodes are fantastic. This is a super robot show where all the strangeness that makes these shows fascinating is mostly all aligned toward a single narrative. It's the complete package in a way that earlier shows sadly weren't. By most objective criteria, it's a good cartoon. Beyond objective criteria, I think Voltus 5 is a particular fascination as a comparison to modern kids' cartoons. Specifically, the action-adventure against an evil empire aimed at a preteen audience cartoon. A common complaint about them is how they are hampered by the restrictions and cliches placed on or adapted for media for children. The good guys can't just kill the bad guys. Societal problems can only be addressed in acceptable ways. The villains take the active role and the heroes only react to that villainy. Voltus 5 is not that kind of show. The Voltus team kill General Belgan and General Garul in combat. The unjust society is violently dismantled. The heroes don't passively wait for the bad guys to come to them, they actively develop and execute upon a plan to seize the initiative. Not to say that it's beyond criticism. The revolution happens against a distant and comfortably unpleasant feudal kingdom, it's safely siloed from Earth's hegemonic liberalism, but it's a show where things happen. It's open to criticism because it actually has things to criticize. And if it doesn't directly address injustice on Earth, it nonetheless imagines a world where it could be addressed. If revolution is possible on Boazan, then it's possible here. If you want to seek out the show for yourself, there's a wealth of ways to do so. 
It's been one of the most accessible Super Robot shows for decades. In the US, it was free to watch on Retro Crush, but sadly they took it off as I was producing this video. It's currently on Crunchyroll with a premium membership. I think in some regions it's available through Amazon Prime, it's, it's also on Blu-ray. I still can't quite believe that these old robot shows are getting English releases. This would have been unheard of in the aughts. Like the support the official release line that ended every fan sub was something of a joke in the super robot community. No one ever thought these shows would actually get one. If you're in the Philippines and your dad hasn't already forced you to watch it, then I think it's still on the air, like to this day. If for some reason you need another way to watch it, ask your uncle. Uh, he has the whole series on something called Video CD.